Thanks, Ian, for inviting me here. I always love coming to the south of England. I studied here at South, in Southampton and did journalism in, in Cornwall, so um, it's, al it's always great. Um, so I, I'm, from, I'm from Future Earth. I love saying to people I'm from Future Earth. It sounds like I'm, 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 I've come here in a time machine and, uh, from, uh, from 2050, and I'm going to say, you know, we, guys, it's great. We made it. We, we, we did it, and here's how. Um, but uh, but I'm, not, I'm not from the future. I'm, I'm from Sweden. <laughs> Um, but in some ways, when it comes to sustainability, we might be sort of one or two years ahead of, uh, of, of some other places. Yeah, so Future Earth. Um Future Earth is, a, is an international research program focusing on, on global sustainability. And um, it's, it started in 2015. Uh, it was announced in, at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit in 2012, along with the SDGs. And in, and in 2015, it, was, uh, it, was, it really started moving. We had a, um, our first director, and uh, it got moving. So it was, um, but it's, it's got a huge background, you know, of 30 years of internationally coordinated research from the World Climate Research Program in 1980 uh, through International Geosphere biosphere program starting in 1987. In fact, a former director of, um, of IGBP is here today, Chris Rapley, who then went on to, uh, uh, to direct the British Antarctic Survey. And, you know, an IGBP is like an intellectual heavyweight. You know, this, this, this is, you know, the formation of earth system science, and a lot of the big concepts in earth system science came from IGBP, and I'm going to talk a bit about, about them and what they mean for the future. And Diversitas on Biodiversity International Human Dimensions program, and then earth system science partnership and finally to, to Future Earth. So, you know, these big programs had uh, 20 projects beneath them, you know, including things like the Global Carbon Project. You know, this is a, a group of, um, you know, hundreds of scientists who come together um, every year and produce the global carbon, but global carbon budget, among other things. And, uh, you know, only through internationally coordinated research is, is this possible, these huge undertakings, huge data and analysis undertakings, uh, looking at both um, the carbon sources from anthropogenic emissions plus carbon sinks where they're going you know 2016 at COP um, you know they announced that um, emissions are actually stabilizing uh, for the first time uh, while the economy has growing largely due to uh, China's uh, huge efforts to reduce its use in coal but also uh, huge efforts in the US which are now uh, in question so um, the Future Earth is made up of, uh, you know, the Governing Council, uh, several UN bodies, uh, International Council for Science, Belmont Forum, the main funding agencies of, uh, of collaborative research internationally. And it's, it's a network of um, about 50,000 uh, global sustainability researchers are, are part of the various networks within Future Earth. So, so a lot of the, 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 the leading international projects are then folded underneath it. We have 11 knowledge action networks, about 20 global research projects, seven regional centers, five, five global hubs in Stockholm, Paris, Montreal, Colorado, and in Japan, in Tokyo. Um, and so how are we um, organized? So the main sort of organizing principle is around um, a series of knowledge action networks, uh, basically you know, looking at decarbonization of the global economy, risk, oceans, natural assets, transformations, bringing in more social sciences to understand uh, the trans transformations in society, how this happens, non, uh, production and consumption. SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, is an overarching theme, and particularly their interconnections. You know, we launched the Urban Knowledge Action network last year and and planetary health is obviously key and it's, it's lovely to see so many people from that the health specialists um, here today so our vision is for people to thrive in a sustainable equitable world and this this seems to be a very very attractive vision we we, we have uh, gaining a huge amount of attention and uh, and energy from the research community plus other stakeholders the business community and and, and policy um, so it's an ext extremely exciting time to be in this sort of startup phase for this uh, this organization um, but let's have a look at you know uh, why are we here you know what are the risks we're, we're actually taking um, so this is a, 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 a this is a, a the uh, Greenland ice core going back 100,000 years, way, way back into the, uh, into the last ice age. And, and Earth w was on a very, very rocky journey uh, through this period. We'll see you know, temperatures swung up and down, uh, you know, up to 20 degrees. Uh, and, you know, and, and humans struggled to survive in that and struggled to adapt. But then 
didn't come the 10,000 years ago. Um, and it's great to see a, a marketing professor earlier mention the Holocene. I think this is, um, a, a shows the mind shift. Um, so uh, 10,000 years ago, we left the Ice Age and entered the Holocene, a remarkably stable period in Earth's history where temperatures uh, went up or down no more than plus or minus one degree Celsius. Um, and it's this. This, this is the climate we know. This is the climate that agriculture uh, you know, emerged. Agriculture emerged almost as soon as we um, left the, uh, the Ice Age and had this stability where farmers could predict um, you know, future weather conditions uh, with a degree of accuracy that allowed them to keep on planting and for this to emerge. Then cities, towns, our global civilization. So this is what um, we're at risk at the moment. And to really understand the risk, um, we need to understand the power of exponentials. Uh, recently, I was at uh, NASA Ames uh, Research Campus in, uh, in Silicon Valley, where we had uh, a group of uh, tech entrepreneurs uh, from the X Prize and Google and elsewhere talking about exponentials, the, the exponential technologies uh, for, for making the lives of one billion people better, you know, the global grand challenges and applying exponential thinking to that. And we're there talking about exponentials too uh, from a more holistic point of view. And really, what do we mean when we're talking about um, to understand how we got from uh, the Holocene to where we're going next, we need to understand this. And if I use an example I call the 36 steps, you know, if I took um, 36 uh, steps you know, across, the, uh, across the room here, you know, after about 10 steps I might get to the, the door out there, maybe 15 steps, and maybe by um, 30 steps I might get um, down the room, maybe th th down, down, down the, uh, the, the road there, and 36 steps. Um, who knows, maybe to the entrance of uh, the, the, the university. Um, but um, if I took 36 um, exponential steps, uh, where would I uh, end up? And what I mean by exponential steps, if I took one step and then the second step was twice as big, and then the next step was twice as big as that, so we're going from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. You know, after 36 steps, where, where would I end up? Um, I just want a sh show of hands here. Uh, would I end up um, on the other side of the uh, university campus? Uh, other side of Plymouth? So, uh, so uh, any shouts? The moon? Any, any takers for the moon? Who thinks would be on the moon? OK, these, uh, this is good. In fact, um, my, after my 36th step, I'd, I would have my foot on Mars. So close. Um, so uh, so you know, exponentials, uh, exp you know, once you get beyond 15 or so, uh, the mathematics gets a bit crazy. Um, so this, uh, this, is, this is where we're going. So I'll give you a short history of, of, of um, why we need to think about exponentials. And uh, this is uh, the latest chapter in the history of, uh, of humanity. It starts in Britain about um, 200 years ago when two or three brilliant inventions fueled the Industrial Revolution. Uh, of course, Britain tried to contain the Industrial Revolution and keep, th uh, keep things secret, but, uh, but failed. And it started spreading like wildfire throughout Europe and North America and uh, to um, Japan and then slowly elsewhere. People started swarming to cities. They became you know, engines of creativity. You know, um, artificial fertilizers started to save millions of lives. We could feed more people. You know, half the people in the world um, are fed now because of them. Antibiotics saved millions of lives. Uh, but by 1950, you know, marketing, tourism, foreign direct investment really started taking into, going into overdrive. And we started to go on this really exponential trajectory. Um, and uh, uh, where we could, where you know, population started doubling very, very quickly. You know, our energy use started accelerating. Um, but we also started noticing changes in um, in the Earth system. Carbon dioxide levels started going up precipitously. We. Um, uh, the ocean acidification, uh, we, we started to measure. You know, the oceans are, um, are acidifying at a rate not seen for 300 million years. Um, we now use an area the size of South America to grow our crops. And we're seeing massive biodiversity loss at mass extinction rates. The last mass extinction was 65 million years ago. We use an area the size of Africa for our livestock. So the scale that humanity is now operating on is, 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 is phenomenal, and as, as, as we're all you know, keenly aware of here. And it's this, um, this great acceleration that, uh, largely driven by uh, uh, the, 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 the analysis of the GIST, dri driven by International Geosphere Biosphere Program, um, you know, forced um, Paul Crutzen, the Nobel Prize winning um, 
uh, a chemist to conclude uh, when he was, always, he was on an IGBP committee that, that Earth had left the Holocene and that we'd entered a new geological epoch, uh, which he termed the Anthropocene. And uh, which is, uh, I think this is one of the most profound um, uh, conclusions. It's up there with Darwin's theory of evolution or Copernicus's heliocentricity as a, a, a defining shift in world views. And, um, and we, we, we created this film for the uh, Rio Plus 20 summit. It opened the, uh, the, the, the summit um, back, back in 2012. Um, so, uh, and this is based on um, you know, a series of uh, great acceleration graphs showing this uh, acceleration from 1750 up to 2010, and particularly the shifts in 1950. Here's the, um, the socioeconomic side of things, and then here's the, uh, uh, the Earth system side of things, biodiversity, coastal nitrogen use, marine fish, um, fish capture. Um, Etc. You know, if we're talking about hockey sticks, we can give you, um, you know, 24 of them. Um, so global development occurred on a stable, resilient planet, and this is now very much at at risk. So um, we published myself and Will Stephan published a paper um, earlier this year, uh, looking at, looking at this. Hey, now how can we frame this? Um, uh, this, this great acceleration. Uh, so, you know, DE over TT, uh, the rate of change of the Earth system um, for 4.5 billion years has been a function of astronomical forces, um, Earth's orbit around the sun and how it's um, altering, geophysical forces, volcanic eruptions, and uh, uh, shift, you know, tectonics, and uh, as continents collide, and we see changing circulation patterns of the oceans as, um, as, as, as currents are blocked off, and uh, internal dynamics, you know, the evolution of things like cyanobacteria. Um, so a new force awakens. Then in the late Holocene, we see uh, anthropogenic indus industrialized societies, um, a new part of this equation. But what we show in the paper, though, that these, these other forcings, astronomical, geophysical, internal dynamics, are currently orders of magnitude smaller than H, than, than industrialized societies, particularly in the last four decades. Um, so we say the rate of change of the Earth system is now a function of human activity, and the rate of change of the Earth system is accelerating. Even though global emissions of CO2, for example, look as if they're stabilizing, um, that we're still emitting huge amounts, and it stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years, but that rate seems to be accelerating over the last few years, and we're not so sure why. And this risks tipping points in the Earth system. If we're going beyond the um, Holocene state, what risks are we taking with the stability of key components of the Earth system? Arctic sea ice, West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, El Nino, the um, uh, boreal forests, the Amazon dieback, Indian monsoon, the African monsoon. And this is a keen area of research. Um, that there's uh, many uncertainties here. But we do believe there's, that we're taking risks of crossing tipping points, even uh, within uh, the uh, Paris Agreement, even at two degrees. Uh, we're, we're currently one degree above pre-industrial. Um, even at two degrees, uh, we might be seeing um, crossing tipping points. And we can see, certainly see signs that give us cause for concern there. So this led, you know, if we have, uh, if we, it, we know the Holocene, uh, we know about tipping points in the Earth system, uh, and we know that we're in the Anthropocene, then how do we stay within a safe operating space for humanity, avoiding these tipping points? Um, so uh, many scientists from IGBP, but led by uh, Johan Rockström from uh, Stockholm Resilience Center, my, uh, my, my other institution, uh, published the Planetary Boundaries Framework in 2009, updated in 2015, um, very much looking at this. And so for the first time, when we talk about the Earth system, it's often uh, this, this complex mass, everything's connected to everything else. Um, but now this, this framework says, well, everything is connected to everything else, but here are the nine things we really, really need to look at. And that four of these, we've gone beyond the boundaries and we're taking um, grave risks for the future. Um, so it's almost like, um, you know, uh, when Bill Gates uh, uh, formed the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, he said it was based on reading a, a newspaper showing a pie chart of the um, seven causes of preventable death uh, for children. And he took it back to Melinda and he said, this, this is our foundation, this is what we need to do. Um, and and that's, uh, th that's how it formed. And I see this as the same in that um, it's creating a, a framework for humanity to look at. This is where we need to go to get stay within these boundaries. Um, so the Anthropocene, I think, is a paradigm shift in our world view. And uh, I think these global change programs have had a, a phenomenal impact um, on this. But now we're moving from Earth system science to thinking about global sustainability science as, a, as an academic discipline, an integrated academic discipline. And this is uh, uh, what Future Earth is doing. So with the Sustainable Development Goals, um, 
of course, many of the authors, um, uh, many of the people involved in these projects and programs um, have been keenly involved uh, with international processes uh, to, to develop them and part of the consultations to develop the sustainable development goals, uh, particularly, you know, producing in, in nature the first um, so academic um, article um, outlining a framework for, um, for, for the goals. Um, so, uh, and this is very, and the, the, the research agenda for Future Earth is very much linked to these, these goals and, uh, and how we achieve them. Um, you know, particularly, yeah, the SDGs um, uh, goal here. So I'm going to speak a little bit about um, one project that uh, we're developing uh, with um, uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, with the Resilience Centre, uh, with Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts, and, and many other partners called the World in 2050. So, and the idea with the World in 2050 is, how, it's like um, almost like the limits to growth, but um, from the 1970s. Uh, but uh, this, in this time, it's, uh, it's, it's growth within limits. How? What are the pathways? You know, if the world has agreed the Sustainable Development Goals, then what are the pathways to actually reach those goals? And how can we use um, you know, integrated assessment models, agent-based models, other modeling to, um, to, to look at those pathways? And, and particularly, you know, the, the, the SDGs finish in 2030, but um, can we operate within a safe operating space for humanity with it by 2050? And uh, this is a big unanswered question um, in, uh, in science. So this is what we're looking at now. We're, we're, we're already framing um, quite a bit of our work in terms of this 2030, 2050 framework. So you know, our diet is responsible for you know, um, a huge amount of tropical deforestation, over 25% of greenhouse gas emissions, and the majority of biodiversity loss. So, um, so recently, there's a whole series of papers uh, looking at the 2050 framework. By 2050, you know, healthy diets, for example, um, could be uh, could reduce global mortality by 6 to 10 percent. And healthy diets in these papers actually refer to uh, lowering meat consumption uh, to 6 percent if, um, if we go for very low meat diets, um, 10 percent if we go for vegetarian, vegan type diets. Um, we could reduce greenhouse gas emissions from uh, up to 70 percent from, from the food system, uh, that is. Halt deforestation. We could feed you know, 9 billion people without further deforestation based on 500 scenarios and reduce biodiversity loss with an economic benefit of up to 31 trillion. Um, so this, this 2050 framework is already um, generating um, a, lot of, a lot of really interesting um, uh, papers that are looking at the pathways and scenarios for the future. Uh, one other one I'd like to speak about is uh, the global carbon law. Uh, we've published a paper recently in Science, uh, a roadmap for rapid decarbonization. Uh, that, you know, when we left, when we left uh, Paris in 2015 after the negotiations for for the Paris Agreement, you know, we were scratching our heads thinking, you know, does, do the policymakers in the room really know what it's going to take to get global emissions down below, um, to, to keep global emissions uh, to, to around zero and to, uh, to keep temperatures to, uh, to well below two degrees? Um, so uh, uh, we, we, we published this paper uh, that um, attempts to, um, to look at it and provide a framing for it. Um, and so, uh, and, and in particular, and so, so here's the challenge. We emit 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide at the moment. By 2050, this has to be more or less around zero. Uh, part of this, this brown here is um, our land use, uh, agriculture, um, emits um, a significant amount of carbon at the moment. So after 2050, then this land use must become a carbon sink somehow. We don't, we don't even know fully how that could, ha could happen. And we have to build new carbon sinks about of the same order of magnitude as the... Uh, the, the carbon sink the ocean provides for humanity at the moment. Because here are the, the carbon, so the oceans and land absorb about half the emissions from human activity in, about, in more or less equal proportions, the oceans a bit more. And as our emissions reduce, um, they uh, then consequently, uh, they, 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 the, the sink capacity reduces there. So we need to create um, huge carbon sinks um, and the, 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 all assumptions, um, all the, most of the major models to get to um, below two degrees assume a lot of bioenergy, carbon capture and storage um, because cumulative emissions 
you know, the, um, stay in the atmosphere and they keep building and this must come out. Um, so the carbon law framing um, is, uh, the other thing about the carbon law framing is that uh, we turn to, to frame it in terms of a carbon, um, carbon law um, analogous to Moore's law in the IT sector and uh, uh, as a, in terms of exponential thinking that uh, we really need to um, halve emissions every decade to, uh, to get to two degrees. So global emissions, we, an incremental pathway is not going to do it. Uh, global emissions need to halve. So from now to 2030, we need to go from 40 gigatons of carbon, carbon dioxide to 20 gigatons. And 2030 to 2040, we need to halve that again to uh, 10 gigatons. By 2040 to 2050, we need to halve that again to about 5 gigatons and, and, and keep doing that. And, um, and only then um, will we reduce the risk substantially of uh, breaking the barriers. And, uh, and this also has a, another effect, though, because um, one of the issues with the Paris Agreement is that if you say, uh, well, we have to get to zero emissions by 2050, then, there's, um, uh, then it's a, a very big temptation to go, OK, well, uh, well, we'll wait till 2040, and then we'll start working on it. Um, and uh, if we wait till 2040 to start working on it, then we genuinely will need a time machine, because the only technology that will um, help us will be to come back in time and start again. Um, and the, uh, so, so this framing, by halving emissions every decade, it, sends, it sets targets for, for nations, for individuals, for, um, for businesses. Uh, this is what they need to do right now and then to get to next. Uh, and we also need to ramp up um, technology to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, so, uh, and one, one final thing from the paper uh, that surprised us, uh, when we looked at current renewable um, energy um, installation, in the last decade it's gone from 0.8% to 2.8%. It's actually on an exponential trajectory. It's doubling every 5.5 years. So we looked at, well, what would happen if we, um, we keep on that exponential trajectory? Um, and this is not what, um, for example, uh, uh, BP and um, other scenarios uh, groups do. They always assume incremental trajectories. If we assume this is an incremental trajectory, then there's no way energy, um, renewable energy is going to make uh, a mark in the uh, energy sector by, um, by 2070, 2080. But if we assume the exponential trajectory, um, then in fact, by 2050, uh, we will get 100% um, renewables. So people have said, well, I mean, this last part, this last last step, how are you going to get there? That's the really difficult problem. But from an economic point of view, it's, well, how cheap does, uh, does solar and renewables need to be? How cheap to, does it need to be to actually um, force or to encourage absolutely everyone to transfer over uh, within that last decade? Um, and we know from, uh, from exponentials over the last 50 years that, in fact, this is, um, uh, this, it's reasonable to assume that we can, the humanity can keep on an exponential trajectory. Um, surprisingly. So um, I'm going to finish talking a little bit about uh, Future Earth in the, current, in the next few months and how you can get engaged. Um, we're going to have a new executive director starting in, uh, in September, uh, Amy Lewis. She's a, a climate scientist. Uh, she's also um, worked um, in Barack Obama's administration as a senior advisor on uh, resilience and, and, and climate. Um, I've worked with her for, for many years. Um, I was talking to Chris earlier, um, who's, who also knows her well. And she, she's really a, a rising star. She's a, a brilliant... Um, uh, a, a brilliant person to join the team. Uh, she's worked for Google, she's worked for the Skull, Skull Global Threats Foundation, so she'll start in Montreal uh, later this year. Um, we've also launched the Future Earth Media Lab um, to do um, a lot more experimentation in storytelling and uh, new digital technologies and uh, engaging with um, uh, the kind of groups uh, the Earth Systems community and global sustainability community hasn't traditionally worked with. I'm particularly interested in this and data visualization and uh, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, we've, we've actually run quite a few hackathons now that are even um, creating spin-out spin businesses that has surprised us. Um, how to get involved? So we have these 11 knowledge action networks. We have 20 global research projects. Um, you can uh, you know, find, your, find your niche um, there. And uh, if you go to our websites and, uh, and, and look to, to join, um, join the networks through those avenues, we have regional offices. Um, we also have an open network, like a sort of Facebook, a social network for um, sustainability science, for sharing ideas, uh, for sparking up projects, catalyzing projects. Um, so if you, uh, you know, go to the Future Earth Open Network, uh, you'll find links on our homepage. And we have the Anthropocene magazine, uh, which is solutions-focused journalists 
journal journalism. We have some leading journalists writing for us, people like Andy Revkin, who formerly worked, wrote for New York Times. Uh, the, the new issue coming out has got um, Oliver Morton from The Economist writing for us. Uh, so you can um, su uh, subscribe to, uh, to the Anthropocene magazine. And I'll just finish with saying, you know, the state of the planet, the prognosis is good. We've reached peak child. Um, that uh, number of uh, uh, ch uh, children per fertile woman is about um, replacement rate, around 2.5. Um, the ozone hole is, looks like it's stabilizing and could recover by 2100. Emissions growth has stalled. I mean, we, we can make it. So I mentioned earlier that I was at um, NASA Ames Research Base um, uh, 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 recently. And uh, I mean, this is the home of astrobiology. It's, I mean, I love it. This is fantastic. And um, they, uh, they're developing concepts, concepts like planetary intelligence. And, uh, and they, they believe actually, you, you know, you'd think that Earth might have achieved this, that planetary intelligence. Um, but no, we, we're a technologically advanced civilization, but planetary intelligence is yet to emerge on Earth, um, may, mainly because this, this rate of change of the Earth system is accelerating. And uh, if, if, uh, if, uh, if the biosphere, um, if a, a species evolves in, in the biosphere that starts controlling the, um, uh, the, the Earth system, uh, you, would, you, would, you wouldn't expect it to be accelerating out of control. But could it emerge? So, um, this is, uh, so this is, these are my hypotheses um, on this. Intelligent life on Earth could emerge by 2050. Um, and you know, we're all agents of change um, here, and uh, we, we, we have the capacity to do it. And we know change can happen very, very rapidly. We're seeing it regionally, we're seeing it nationally, we're seeing it, you know, in, in businesses. Um, and uh, so hypothesis two, stable anthropocene state of the Earth system exists. Um, this is a bit of an open question, uh, actually, and Earth system scientists are keenly looking into it. And deep knowledge of exponentials and resilience is uh, essential for planetary intelligence um, to emerge. And with those um, three thoughts, I, I, I will not um, get between you and your, your wine, uh, but thank you very much again for inviting me. It's, a, it's, it's always a pleasure to be here, and thanks for listening. Thank you.